All right, hello, hello everyone, and welcome back to our third video for Unit 1, Area Study 1, Thinking Like an Economist for BC Economics. We've already talked about production possibility diagrams, trade-offs, cost benefit analysis, living standards, uh, microeconomics, macroeconomics, positive nominative economics. And then today we're going to be moving on to what's known as the three basic economic questions, and as well as the two-sector model of economic activity, which will be kind of a building block at the five sector model later in the year and in year 12. So without any further ado, let's get straight into it. Um, so we're gonna be looking at the um, three basic economic questions. So what and how much to produce, how to produce, and for whom to produce. And we're gonna be looking at the importance of those. And then we're gonna be looking at the two sector circular flow model of the economy, what that means, the importance of it, basically how that impacts on economic activity. For any of you playing along from yesterday's videos, which is probably much different for you depending on when you're watching these, yes, I did get my coffee yesterday after talking about it for so long, and it was so potent, I think I could see time. So, the three basic economic questions. Um, economic choices need to be made in our market capitalist system. Um, we're gonna talk about this on the latest slide, but a market capitalist system is basically where um, the free market owns 80% of resources, or allocates 80% of resources, and the government allocates the other 20%. It's really important that government allocates 20% of resources because there are certain types of production that wouldn't be created if the government didn't provide them for the economy. So we're gonna look at these questions and why they're important. So what and how much to produce, how to produce, and for whom to produce. We're gonna look at them one by one. So let's get going into the first one. We have what and how much to produce. So our market capitalist economy, the majority of resources are privately owned, like we just said, so privately owned. Um, and the allocation of resources is determined primarily by the market. That basically means the forces of supply and demand decide what is going to be produced. Um, so whatever consumers want, essentially, what consumers need and want to dictate what we want to have produced. So businesses are gonna make what society wants. Why do they do that? Well, they want their products to sell. And if they don't make what society needs and wants, their products won't sell and they will go out of business. Therefore, it makes sense to produce the goods and services that consumers are demanding. The government then controls about 20% of resources to prevent what's called market failure, which once again becomes very important in year 12, which includes the underproduction of essential services or the overproduction of goods and services, which will um, negatively impact living standards. So when we look at the underproduction of essential services, we look at things like education, healthcare, um, parks, anything that isn't really profitable for private businesses. And so the government provides these because they make society better off and we need them. Um, whereas the free market does the other 80% and they will just make whatever consumers need and want. So what and how much to produce, they look at what consumers are demanding and they make a lot of it. So that doesn't always lead to good things. Sometimes like cigarettes, alcohol, gambling, a lot of that gets produced because consumers want a whole lot of that stuff. But for the most part, businesses make what we need and want, which is great because that helps satisfy our living standards. So that's how they decide what and how much to produce. They decide it based on the needs and wants of consumers and what they are demanding. How to produce. How to produce is all about the resource um, allocation and ask which combination of factors of production will be used to produce goods and services. So the example here is, do we use more labor than machinery or use machinery to replace labor? So how to produce, are we gonna make these things by hand? Are we gonna use machinery? Are we gonna use a production line to do so? How to produce is gonna be really important because it's gonna affect your cost of production, it's gonna affect your efficiency, um, it's also gonna affect how long it takes to make those goods and services. So that's a very important question for businesses or producers. And then lastly, for whom to produce? This is concerned with how goods and services are distributed to society. So if it was just left to free markets, the wealthy would have far greater access to goods and services than those on low incomes. So therefore, the government sometimes provides incentives to producers to produce goods and services that will benefit all of society or low income earners. So they may produce um, basically things like, well, the government subsidizes things like immunization so that low income households can afford it. And same with medication, so low income households can afford it, but still just as profitable for the businesses to make. So things like insulin, if it wasn't subsidized by the government through the PBS, it would be very, very expensive and people who are diabetic might not be able to afford it. 
which would then make their living standards far worse off. So for the most part, for whom to produce, um, business is going to produce for whoever has the money to pay for the goods and services they're making, but the government will sometimes give incentives to producers, like subsidies or tax incentives, so they produce goods and services that benefit all of society or low-income earners. Then we get on to the two-sector model of um, circular flow in the economy. So the two-sector model, usually if I was doing this in class, I'd have nothing on the board right now, and then we'd do this one by one, we're talking about. Um, so first up, what we'll do, we draw this household sector here, over here. Sometimes I do it with a really dodgy picture of a house. So we'll give that a door and a chimney and some smoke coming out of the chimney. And then we also would then go and say the, house, the business sector over here. So these are the two sectors we care about in the economy. They impact each other quite a lot. And we start to talk about how they impact each other. And that's what the two sector flow model is all about. So it's all about what households provide businesses and then what businesses provide households in return. And there's four flows that we look at and they are all equally important to know um, basically how economic activity happens and how money flows through the economy. So first up, we talk about businesses being the ones that produce goods and services, but what do they need to produce goods and services? They need resources. So resources are really important. Um, and who provides those resources? Well, households provide those resources. So what ends up happening is households provide resources to the business sector, as you see in this first flow here. And what resources do they provide? Almost always students will straight away say labor, which is 100% correct, but households might not only provide labor, they could also provide um, natural or capital resources. So you might be providing a factory, you might own a factory and rent it out to businesses. So they might um, buy that off you. You might have a lot of land that they can use, therefore you are providing a natural resource. Um, so they can provide any of the three types of resources. And if you provide a resource to a business, what are they gonna do in return? Well, in the flow back to households, they pay incomes to those households. So no matter what resources you provide them, you'll get some kind of income in return. So this could be wages, this could be rent, this could be dividends, like all these kind of things our incomes paid back. So then, so you provide resources, money has come back to the household sector. When the household sector gets that money, what are they gonna do with it? So when you get paid with your income, what do you do? You start demanding goods and services. You're gonna buy things, you're gonna buy your weekly groceries, you're gonna pay your bills, you're gonna do all these different things. And this creates the overall flow of spending or aggregate demand for finished goods and services. And that flows back to the business sector. So the business sector then finds out the total amount of demand for goods and services. And if you're the business sector and you hear the total level of demand for goods and services, what are you gonna do? You're gonna produce exactly that much because that is gonna maximize your overall sales, make sure there's no excess stock. And that leads to the nation's flow of finished goods and services produced or GDP, uh, which is known as gross domestic product. So then those goods and services are distributed to households, we consume them, um, then business, it starts all over again. Businesses then need resources, they pay for those resources. We spend that money on um, demanding goods and services, businesses produce those. To produce those, they need resources, and it goes, goes around and around and around almost endlessly. That's the two sector model and how households and businesses impact each other. So there are three main parts to that that we look at. There's production, income, and expenditure. So production is the process of making goods and services. Uh, fairly obvious there. Income is a reward given to those involved in the production of goods and services. And expenditure is the spending um, of income on goods and services. And as you can see through that model, so how they went back and forth over time, back and forth from each other to create a circular flow. What it says is over time, these three things are all going to be equal because they all flow into each other. So um, to produce, businesses need resources, which means they have to pay income for those resources. That income then becomes expenditure, and that expenditure shows businesses just how much they need to produce. And it just loops on and on and on endlessly. So one leads into the other, which leads back to the first one, and they all end up being relatively equal. When we look at this later on, and in year 12, there is some that leaks out, for the most part, that is what you need to know right now. So any increase in economic activity, on average, increase material living standards. So if production, income and expenditure are increasing, that means material living standards should be increasing as higher production levels 
often mean there is more employment and income overall, which is great. So we want more economic activity because that tends to mean there is more employment and income. And then lastly, um, it can impact our non-material living standards. So we've talked about these already in lesson one, but non-material living standards include things like access to clean air, water, natural resources, access to health and education, congestion or pollution levels, depletion of resources, exposure to crime, job satisfaction, leisure time, and stress. Um, essentially why we've still got this here is that if there is an increase in economic activity, that usually leads to an increase in material living standards. But it could either improve non-material or make non-material living standards worse. It depends. So part of the reason why that is the case is so if we're increasing economic activity, we could also be increasing congestion or pollution levels. We could be depleting resources more. Uh, people could have less leisure time or job satisfaction because they are working a lot more. And if any of these are the case, it means non-material living standards are going down. However, on the other hand, if people are earning more income, they might be less stressed because they feel good because they've got more money to spare. They might have more access to resources, which is great, more access to health and education. So it could affect non-material living standards either positively or negatively, depending on the situation. All right, that's it for today. So um, that's all for the two second model and the three basic economic questions. If you want to do any work for this, there's a link to a worksheet for it in the description below. Um, other than that, next lesson, we're going to be moving on to the kind of next part of this topic, which looks at the modern and traditional view of consumer behavior. That will probably be up sometime next week. And if you're doing this next year, it would have been up for months. So that's not going to be an issue. If you have any questions, leave a comment below, send me an email. I'm more than happy to help. But other than that, I hope you have a wonderful day and I will see you next time. Goodbye.